What's up everyone, Lance Hedrick here, and today we're taking a look, finally, at the Sanremo U. Now this machine has been out for about a year or so now. I was able to get this as a loaner from a friend of mine that recently moved to Lisbon, and I've really been putting it through the tests. Sit back, relax, and have a good time, baby, because that's what we're here to do. This machine was created to be uh, for the home enthusiast, for the upper echelon of home enthusiasm, because it's a very expensive machine. For instance, in the United States, it costs about 7,500 US dollars. In UK, around 6,000 pounds. In Europe, around 5,400 or something euros. Is really tailored to people who have, you know, a, a massive obsession with coffee, have the expenditure to be able to afford this, and really want to, you know, save up and push a lot of their, you know, finances into something that's going to bring them daily joy. It is commercially certified, but for reasons I'll later note in the video, I would not recommend it for a cafe unless it's being used as like a single origin espresso option or something that won't see a lot of volume. This one has a 0.5 liter, half a liter brew boiler and a one liter steam boiler. And the idea for this is quicker heat up times and more energy efficient. What that means is for people in the US with 110 volt, it's not gonna be able to really heat them up both as efficiently as it can on a higher voltage machine. They have tried to figure out a new way uh, it, to give you precise pressure control. It is not a gear pump in here. It's actually a, a, a very common rotary vein pump. It has a running rate of about 1450 RPM, but you can modulate the RPM, the, the speed of it spinning, from 500 to 3000 RPM, which will greatly change the pressure output. Uh, Danilo at San Remo has f figured an idea to have a discussion between the pump and the back pressure of the group head. So essentially, it's responding in real time to the differences in the pressure being experienced at the puck. So they're reading pressure somewhere around here behind the group head, they're reading back pressure, and it's communicating that to the pump and it oscillates the RPM based off of the pressure it's experiencing. Let's say that we dial in a shot and we want it to do four bar, nine bar, four bar, six bar, three bar. I don't know why you do that, but let's say we do that. What it's gonna do is if you put in a coffee puck that is super finely ground like cement, you'll hear the RPM go way down because it doesn't need to push as much water in order to achieve those pressures. So you'll hear the RPM whenever it's pushing it because it doesn't need as much RPM. You put in coarser ground coffee, as I talk about my flow video I released recently, if you have lower resistance, it needs higher flow. So you'll hear the RPM speed up greatly in order to achieve the set pressure you put into the group head itself. So if you've ever used the La Marzocco GS3 MP, then you'll know that manual paddle at the top, it's very responsive. Like right when you move it, boom, the pressure changes. Now, of course, with that, there's no tech on it, you're not saving profiles, you're not doing any of that stuff, but that motion, it's immediately responsive because the gear pump is incredibly responsive. It is much more responsive in my experience, which we'll talk about in a bit, than uh, the one here. Their main goal that I've gathered is for repeatability and consistency. So that is one of the main aspects of this machine that I really put under pressure when I was testing, no pun intended. I have always really enjoyed San Remo Steam One, and this is no exception. The Steam One does a fantastic job. Uh, maybe we'll show a little milk steaming later in the video, but in 10 drinks, it might drop from two bar to 1.7 bar, but that's more than acceptable. And you have control over how much pressure you want inside of that steam boiler, which can help you if you know you're having issues steaming your milk, it's too high pressure or whatever, leave with a high pressure. You know, work on that positioning. Watch my Silky Milky video. You're gonna be fine. They're mixing cold water with the steam boiler water. So it's steam boiler water still, not brew boiler but it is mixing it in order to give you kind of like a specific temperature. If you like Americanos and you want it 60 Celsius, you can mess around with it until you find the right temperature, set that percentage in the group head, and every time you use this, it's gonna come off. The fact that it is from the steam boiler still is you need to have the steam boiler on in order to use it. So keep that in mind. You can set up like six or seven different times for the machine to turn off, turn off, turn on, turn off, turn on the brew boiler, steam boiler, whatever boiler you want, you're good to go. There's only those two boilers, so I don't know why I said whatever boiler you want, but you get what I'm saying. Now, what's really interesting is what they've done with the group head. You might take a look at it and go, yeah, of course, that's electronically saturated. That's in vogue. We're done with these 61s. That's not what they did. They said, you know what? We're gonna take an E61 group. We're gonna modify it. We're gonna add a little something, something to that group head in order to make it a bit more efficient. This is the Lelite 
Bianca. What you see here, this big old hunk of brass that's chrome plated, this is the E61 style group head. And I have a full video breaking down the internals of this with a, a cutaway version of this exact machine. There are two pipes that go to the boiler and it's siphoning water from the boiler into the group head back out, bada bing, bada boom, bada bing. And over time, it slowly heats up this hunk of brass. Because it's worked, it's going so slowly through this group and these tiny little capillaries in the group head, it takes quite a while to sufficiently heat up and the temperature is pretty wild. Well, what they have done is they've bought this stock piece, it's like if I could rip that off the machine and hold it, and there's that thermosiphon loop, they said, you know, we're not gonna thermosiphon this bad boy. That's inefficient, that's not gonna work for us. What we're gonna do is we're gonna, boom, hot water into the top hole, bottom hole, we're gonna take this cartridge, we're just gonna shove it right on in there, and then they PID control the cartridge. So you can heat that group head up, so you're not relying on the boiler to get to temperature first, and then to start the thermosiphon loop. Instead, this is heating up independently from the boiler. Since the boiler is so small, much smaller than the one in the Bianca, that heats up in no time, and the group head heats up on its own in no time, because of that cartridge. And the idea is this is going to improve thermal stability, and by giving you the use user the control over the temperature of both the boiler and the group head, you can, you know, finesse it to the way that you want. If you want for some reason to brew boiler at 96 degrees Celsius, but you want this the head to act like a heat sink uh, so that it doesn't experience an increasing temperature throughout the shot, but like as it comes, it kind of slows down the temp, you can set the group head to 85 degrees if you want. Or the other way around, if you want the temperature in the brew boiler to be lower and you want it to experience a, a brief heat up right at the end, you can switch those to 85 in the brew boiler, 95 at the group head. They're taking this very well-established type of group head and they have fancified it. If you do need to service it, they're very easily serviceable. Of course, you have to get past the control unit here, the all the wires and the electronics and the screen and all of that. But once you get behind it, it's pretty nuts and bolts. You, there's a, a metal piece that covers that exhaust valve from the E61 group. At the end of the shot, when the solenoid is enacted, it spits water from down here. And so that's like a decent amount of water waste that happens every single shot. Whenever I get new machines, I like to intuitively use them. Take them out of the box, just go, just play, just see how it's like. So I did that with this machine, and I originally absolutely loathed entirely the drip tray, but it's because I'm an idiot, okay? So, whereas I'm still not a big fan of the drip tray, uh, it's not as nearly as bad as I originally thought it was. Now when they ship this machine, they have the, the settings set to the front two screw holes. And the, the idea for this is it'll shove it back about a centimeter and a half, two centimeters, so that it's more compact for shipping. And then when you get it, they have a little flyer inside that says immediately, unscrew these thumb screws, move the tray so it comes out a bit more than rescrew them. Because I wasn't doing that, because it was on that back setting, this thing did not want to come out of here. It was impossible to pull out. It was too far sunk into the machine. And so every time the drip tray would fill up, I had to tilt it a ton in order to get it out. I would spill water all over the, my counter and it would, it would, it would TMO, as Kit Dynamite would say. Own oh, right now. It's a really shallow drip tray. So if this gets full, whenever this little red thing goes, yo, I'm ready to be dumped. Whenever that happens, uh, yeah, you're too late probably, because then you're walking, you're like, oh, hmm. And a big thing I want to emphasize in this video before we continue is the receptivity of San Remo on user feedback. There was a lot of feedback on discontent with the drip tray. And the biggest reason is because it doesn't really have much room. So you look at it and you're like, no, that seems pretty big, especially when you pull it out, it looks, looks pretty massive. Well, no, it's actually really not. And it's because you have this hunk of metal right here, which is holding that exhaust valve of the E61. So this protrudes quite a bit. To give you an idea, like this, and put it in, look at that, overhang to the moon and back. And of course, the, the, the distance from the spouts to that scale, I mean, that's impossible. You can never use an Akaya Pearl. This is a ridiculously clunky scale. So let's do, you know, a more expensive, you know, more compact scale. You put that there, and I mean, that's on the very front of that drip tray. We take a more American-sized cup, put it right there, and I mean, that is just, uh, that's like, almost close to Topple City. The reason I bring this up is because the team has heard the complaints and they are currently working on a drip tray that's about a centimeter, a centimeter and a half longer that you could retrofit onto your machine. They also listen to the feedback of customers, which is the fan is too loud, as you can hear. Mm -hmm. 
that's the pitch of the fan right there. A lot of people were uh, just really TO'd about that. And so they've actually switched fans to a silent one. You can retrofit it. I have not done it because, you know, I didn't feel like it. They've been listening to users on a lot of other things dealing with the firmware. And because this is a highly technical machine and there is a USB port, you can actually update the firmware as time goes on. No problem. It actually, the new machines have Wi-Fi modules in them and you can actually update over uh, online. Though I will say the thumbnail is much faster. It's like, bing, done. And I'd be remiss to not bring up the Facebook group that, that's for San Remo users. And they, you know, talk about all things coffee theory. They talk about the machine, about issues, and people are constantly helping each other in a really healthy way. It's actually a fantastic group of users that I've been a part of since I got the machine. And Andrea, one of the creators of it, he listens to it and he works on firmware updates and different updates to the machine based largely on their feedback. This is where it all gets crazy. There have been a lot of videos showcasing all the capabilities of this machine. Originally, the machine came and there was no Wi-Fi with it. You were strictly reliant upon the USB in here. It would just be a nice touch if they added like a little San Remo USB stick. That way you can know this is only for San Remo updates. Like I have the Senesso one only for Senesso updates. Now they have Wi-Fi modules on all new ones coming out. And so you can do updates online. It is a kind of a tedious process and a lot of it still looks like it's kind of in beta form. Um, um, and it, which is kind of frustrating. For instance, I still have not been able to connect my phone to the machine, but they do have a, what's called the cloud. You'll see on here, it says search again, scan QR code or access to cloud. There's a QR code in the actual menu, but on the back of the drip tray, there's one. I've scanned it a thousand times, connected to the Wi-Fi signal that the machine puts out. I've done everything, doesn't work. Searching doesn't work. So you click access to cloud. I've named the machine the inimitable you, <laughs> cause I'm clever like that. But I click on that. I've already registered this device and the network status is connected. And this gives you identically what the app gives you. It just would be cool to be able to open the app and have it directly there. The app does not tell you anything the, the group head doesn't, which is a good and a bad. It's a good because I hate needing to have an app in order to access things, but it's a bad because this has a lot of information on a small screen and I would love to be able to expand upon a lot of it. And you would think the app might be able to offer that and it currently does not. Here you can see the steam boiler pressure in real time. You can see the brew boiler the temperature in real time. You can see the tank fill level. You can see uh, the, pat the last extraction, which I just you know, cleared a bit, so it says 0.3. And daily, it says only two shots. This thing I have noticed is pretty clunky. Um, it uh, does not, it doesn't, in my experience, it hasn't been showing me accurate representations of the amounts I've been pulling. Anyway, you can turn the machine on or off there. There, so, and it shows you the, the warnings with that little triangle and the exclamation point. You have settings you can go to, programming, counters, Wi-Fi, alarms, user settings, etc. P stands for purge. So if you wanna purge out the machine, you just click that P and it's gonna give you like a couple of second purge. Boom. Over here is manual which means it's just gonna pull a nine bar shot. Now we have one, two, three. Those are your three programmed buttons. Now the way that you can program these buttons, this is where it gets a bit complex. You go to that top middle option where there's a clipboard, you click that. This is your three programmed options, one, two, three. I have custom profile one, and you can change the names, I just didn't. Uh, standard profile two, paddle profile six, there are different things you can change them to. If you're ever forgetting what was option one again, you click that little clipboard and it shows you. Now, if you want to look at your most previous shot, this little graph down here, you click that. Now my last shot was a purge, so it's kind of showing that. And we come back to the home with that little home button on the top. So if you want to change what one, two, and three are, you have to click these, that little hamburger on top, those three lines. You have languages, time and date, screensaver, Wi-Fi, extraction profiles. Oh, I think that's what I want. Look, you have all these extraction profiles, okay? So you have standard profiles and custom profiles that come loaded on here. Now, if you want to change one of the custom profiles, you just click on one, boop and then you see what the custom profile is. This one you know, starts at a lower pressure, goes up to like eight-ish bar, it stays at eight, and then it kind of decreases. You can change the name by clicking that pencil, or you can click over, and look, we have the pre-infusion stage. So the way it's this machine works, it has three stages that you can partially control. So you have pre-infusion. This is the stage at the beginning, essentially, what first happens with the puck. You can control the amount of pressure of pre-infusion with this sliding scale, and it goes up to 5.9 bar, you also have the plus or minus you can change it with, let's say 4.5. You can do the amount of time you want the puck to experience that pre-infusion pressure. So let's say 5.5 seconds. 
Then you have to click check to save it, and then next screen. Now you have the full infusion. So what is the main pressure? What is the pressure of the what they call infusion, right? What is the peak and where it stays for the majority of the shot? You can make it 9 bar all the way up to 12 bar, and you can go all the way down to like... It doesn't like these low numbers, but you can go all the way down to 0.3. All right, so let's just come back up. Uh, Post-infusion is after your main stage of infusion, obviously, you can have it ramp back down. You can't control the speed at which it ramps down. It just goes from nine to whatever bar you set. So you can do five bar ramp down and you can choose the amount of milliliters of water going through the group head you want for that post-infusion. So let's say it's 10 milliliters. So when we go back, you can see the pre-infusion goes up to main infusion, down to post-infusion. What this is telling you for that post-infusion, the reason I say it can be confusing, is you don't see on any of the screens the amount of mils. You just see milliliters for the post-infusion. And that's because whenever you are going on your main menu, you go to that clipboard, you set the full amount of espresso here, or the full amount of water going through the puck here. Flow meters are not accurate, like, at all. Essentially, they'd ran some tests where they had moved the temperature of their group head up a few degrees, and there was a difference in the volume that came out at set volumes. So the, vo the amount of water that came out was different at two different temperatures. So you change the full amount of water that goes through the puck here, so that can be confusing. It's not gravimetrics. You're doing it based off of the flow of water going through the puck. So you have to take into account the amount of water the puck will absorb. So if you want to guess about roughly twice, so if you have a 20 gram dose, maybe 40 grams is lost to the puck. Okay. And then let's say you want a 40 gram shot. So that's 80 milliliters overall, 40 for the puck, 40 for the shot. And then they say there's about an eight gram retention in the group head itself. So you need to schedule around 88 right? It doesn't affect the performance of the machine. I just have to put ridiculously high numbers in here. And so it's like there's an offset of like 40 milliliters I found on mine. It's very consistent for what it can do, but it's always like 40 mils off. So instead of doing 80 milliliters for a shot, I have to do 120. Because this is not a perfect system, I have noticed fluctuations of any of plus or minus two and a half grams when I pull the same shot repeatedly. So if I put in like a, a lever style shot or something and I pull five shots in a row, there you can expect a fluctuation of plus or minus 2.5. Now those are the extremes. I would say more so the average is plus or minus one to 1 1.5, but you can occasionally get two, two and a half grams over or under your desired shot. Now something like the Decent is also working with not ideal uh, uh, measuring of, of flow. They're using an algorithm, but they do have gravimetrics installed. So it's much more accurate whenever you're pulling your shots. So that's something that's kind of confusing is you have to set the full amount of milliliters before you pull the shot. But when you're programming the shot, you're expected to know the amount of milliliters you want on post-infusion. And then everything else is about time. So the pre-infusion is not about milliliters. It's about time. The main infusion is just the pressure. And then the post-infusion is just volume and pressure. And all this information splayed on the screen all at once is also just kind of intimidating. And because it's on this small screen, I mean, it just takes a lot of squinting and looking and trying to understand everything. They've packed a lot of information on this small screen, like a lot. I'm gonna just pull a manual shot. I'm not gonna click the manual button, I'm gonna use this. Uh, so this right here is controlling the pressure so the further you go, you're gonna see on the screen, you're gonna see the set pressure with this. And it's supposedly gonna give you real-time pressure at the top. But as we see with this naked, with nothing in the puck, it's not actually giving you real-time pressure. It's giving you an approximation based off of a reading inside the machine. And I have found with pressure testing, which we'll show later, that it's not necessarily always accurate. But anyway, so let's do a profile where I go to, you know, as we see, it's 5.6 bar at the bottom. It's saying real-time pressure is 5, 5.2, 5.3. It's saying it's there, but it's not. Right? It's showing me the milliliters that is being extracted or that's gone through the puck. We see the amount of time. We see the temperature here. We see the flow rate. You go back down to 5.5. You can come all the way down, you know, all the way down. We're at 0 0.9, 0 0.6, whatever. Turn it off. So after the shot is done, you can just scroll over and you can see the last one, the 185 mils, 22 seconds. And then what you can do is you can click last shot graph. So we click that. Now this is where it gets a little interesting. So yes, immediately, the, well, the reason I'm showing you this is this little button down here with the star, you can save it as Paddle Profile 6, then later you can change that to some other name, that whatever you're wanting. But um, so you can save whatever you previously did. So whereas there's a lot of limitations on building your own profile on the screen, if you use the manual paddle, you can save and replicate that uh, based off the pressure that has been saved in the system. But anyway, we're gonna come back and we're gonna look at this last shot graph. Now this first graph is showing pressure, showing the pressure curve. Now, as you can see, there was no resistance, so it's obviously not showing real-time pressure here. 
But anyway, uh, what's going on is you see every five seconds there's a white line and you have zero to 12 because there's a 12 bar capability of this machine. If you go all the way fully open, it can hit 12 unless you change it, which we'll show you in a bit. So, you know, nothing, nothing super wrong with that, except maybe it's a little confusing to look at, but they're just trying to be a little different. Uh, on the next one, you see the flow. This is where it gets pretty annoying for me. So as you see, the numbers on the y-axis, it goes zero for zero milliliters a second, one, two, three, three and a half, four, and it jumps to eight. So it's absolutely not scaled in the slightest. So whenever you see the difference between four and eight, it looks like the same difference between three and a half and four and the same difference between zero and one. It's very confusing. I, I do not like that at all. Visually, it's not helpful. It doesn't really do anything. And there's no way to uh, look at this in the app on the phone. It doesn't like expand it or show anything else. You don't see it. So it's very, that's a very frustrating thing. And another massively frustrating thing is if you pull a shot longer than about 40 seconds, it won't show the graph past that. So let's say that we do a shot that, you know, takes, I don't know, a 20 second pre-infusion. Then we have like a 30 second infusion. The final 10 seconds of that will not be shown up on the graph, which uh, when I'm doing some play profiles at the end, I'll show you that. But it, it, it's very, I mean, that's, a, that's an easy firmware update, but it's like, man, and I guess I can understand why it's because it would be way too smushed on such a small screen. But if it's not available in the app, it's not available here, then you're never gonna see that profile. Now, another thing that's really odd is, as I showed you, if you come up to the, the little uh, hamburger menu up top and you go to extraction profiles, it only shows the standard and custom profiles. It doesn't show the paddle profiles. In order to get to the paddle profiles, you have to come to the little clipboard where it shows one, two, and three. And then you have to click the down arrow on any one of those and then you can get to the paddle profiles, which are at the bottom. So let's say we want paddle profile six. Now the number one shows paddle profile six. Only when you do that can you come into it and change the name of paddle profile six to LLLOVE, beautiful, check. When you click on it, you can see the curve, but as you can see, this is one of those long shots I programmed earlier, and you don't see the ending of the shot. Uh, and then obviously you can't change any parameters because it was made with the manual paddle and there's no control over funky controls other than pre-infusion, post-infusion, and infusion. And we know how limiting that is. That's a lot. And that's what I'm trying to say is there is a lot going on with this machine. It's not very intuitive. The UI is a bit clunky. It still seems like it's in a beta version um, and it's not, um, it's just not ideal for me. That being said, for a lot of you at home that want this pressure profiling, this is really the only machine I really know of that has the tech in order to replicate pressure profiles. Now, of course, this one doesn't have the cold infusion of water that the Decent does, which that one is still, to my knowledge, the only one doing true temperature profiling where you're able to make wild swings in temperature. This one, you're able to you know, play with the temp drop of the, of the group head and maybe see if there's a drop of temperature as the shot is extracting, as the group head is leaching the heat from the hot water coming into it. But other than that, you're kind of stuck at whatever temperature you're at, which leads me to temperature stability. Oftentimes it'll be maybe a degree or two below what the set temperature is. If And this is assuming the group head temp and the boiler temp are same temperatures. If you increase the group head temp, it usually is hitting it right on the money. But uh, what happens is over time, that temperature, if you're pulling a ton of shots, the temperature will decrease as expected. And there is some up and down modulations between the shots. And if this sits on for a while, it can get a little hotter. But like I said, this is where it comes into you to kind of control that cartridge and that uh, brew boiler. Honestly, it's not as good as something like the Decent. The stability on this is not as good as something like the La Marzocco Linea. But again, this is a completely different setup. I still don't think it is where the saturated groups are. I saw a comment where people were saying that, you know, La Marzocco did a great job of hammering into their fan base this idea that saturated group is necessary for stability, but this one, this is a different way of getting it. Yes, unless you're pulling a lot of shots. So I do think that for a short range, it's similar to like a heat exchanger. Heat exchangers can have decent temp stability for a few shots. And then as it sits idle or whatever, it, it's gonna go kind of buck wild. This one doesn't go as buck wild, but the temperature is not as stable as I think it could be. I think with enough variations, you could figure out an ideal scenario for your home uh, setup, but in reality, like I said, if you're pulling you know, three, four shots a day, you're a typical home enthusiast, the, the stability is good. This pump is supposed to respond in direct relation to the pressure, the back pressure of the puck itself. If we've set a pressure at nine bar to go down to six, to go back up to nine, if it goes to six and then it loses a lot of resistance in the original flow rate that did work, no longer works, 
uh, in order to hit that nine bar again, then the flow rate should go up. If it's communicating with the group, the, the pump, which is capable of more flow rate, should increase the flow rate to hit nine bar until obviously it can't continue increasing flow rate. I have put this against a, a lot of other pressure gauges and it, it's absolutely a fantastic one. And in fact, I know one of the people at San Remo relies on these as well for their testing. So anyway, what, what I did is since this has a valve, I'm able to kind of emulate the puck kind of dissolving. I'm a little skeptical on reproducibility. What it says on the screen is not necessarily what's in reality. So even though it says on the screen it's replicating the profile perfectly, and it even shows you a nice graph that it did hit nine bar or whatever it was, I'm not convinced it's always doing that. Um, and, and you're gonna see why. The second thing is the reaction of when I move this is actually kind of slow. It takes some seconds to really build up to that. Whereas on the La Marzocco MP, because they're using a gear pump, it's essentially immediate. Right when you move that paddle, that pressure goes up or down, whichever direction you move it. This one, there seems to be more working pieces in place. And because that RPM has to change drastically in the motor, it takes time for it to catch up, go through the system. And if, you know, even though it's a pressurized system, it takes some time to really be able to affect the changes you're making. I'm going to set this to, let's say, Let's just say nine bar. I'll set the paddle to nine bar and I'm gonna let it run indefinitely. And I want you to watch the pressure gauge, okay? I'm gonna set the valve slowly more and more open and we're gonna see the response time of the machine to get it back to nine. And at some point, it's gonna just kind of give up. This can go up like 15 milliliters a second. Even though there's more milliliters a second that pump can give us, it's gonna kind of just quit at some point. So I'm gonna set it to nine. Let me get it to nine real quick. Okay, we are at nine, all right. Then we open it up. All right, so we're at nine on the pressure gauge. Now I'm gonna open it quite a bit. See, it goes down, but it's trying to fight back up to nine. Open it up, look at this, you ready? It's fighting, it's fighting, it's fighting, it's fighting. We're only at nine, 10 mils a second. 11.5, maybe I opened up a bit too much, it can't get back up. 11, 12 mils a second, 13.2. See, it has more it can go up, but it's not going up all the way. I've had it go to 15 mils a second, but it's not wanting to do it. So I tighten the valve back up a bit. We go back to nine. Open it. See, there's a lag. It's climbing back up to nine. It's only at seven mils a second, so it should be able to get back to nine. 6.7, but it's not quite at nine. We tighten it up. We're going to do it again one more time. We're at nine and it says it's at, see now it's saying it's at five mils a second. I don't believe that because I'm pretty much at a closed valve. It's not even coming out that fast. Four mils a second, it's showing that it's going down. And then we, boom, we open it and there's the lag coming back, takes a few seconds. Come back to nine, come on. We're only at five mils a second. It should be able to get back. Now we're at six mils a second. So as you see, it is reactive. So I did see skepticism that this was just a speed pump and that there was no closed loop, but there is. A question is, can we replicate the pressure of uh, some sort of profile in here? Number one and number three are my fun little love profiles, which just to give you a look at that, it's supposed to build up to, at five seconds, it should be at eight bar, then it should go up to about 12 bar until about 10 seconds, then it should cascade down to about 10 bar at 10, 15 seconds, and then it should decrease all the way down to around, I don't know, one, one at about 20 seconds. We're gonna kind of look and see how this replicates it. I'm gonna just put the valve where it's somewhat open. It should be able to react to wherever the valve is as long as, as long as it's not so loose that there's not enough flow for the pump to achieve it. Anyway, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna hit one here. And we're gonna see what happens. So we start off, it should go up to 12 pretty quickly and it gets to, there we go. It got up to uh, uh, right below 12. It's like at 11. It's at 11. It's hovering at 11. And we're at 3 mils a second. Now we drop. We're dropping, dropping. We go down to 3. We go down to... There we go. We're down to like 1-ish. Now, uh, I'm going to let the shot keep going. But you might be able to see on the screen a red uh, triangle with an exclamation mark has uh, shown up. This always happens when you go down below like one bar of pressure or even like 1.5 the it doesn't like it it'll do it i found but it doesn't like it the machine's like i hate you right now uh, and it'll show zero mils a second which obviously isn't necessarily accurate but uh, the machine really doesn't like me for doing that and now here it comes back up to 12 which is part of the profile you just can't see it because the graph stops at 40 seconds so now it's back up to 12 
and it's actually hitting 12, just past 12 this time. The first time it didn't quite get to 12. So it's not, it's not exactly hitting everything identically, I have found. Uh, and as you change coffees, it, it makes it a little more difficult. After reading all of it and actually pulling espresso, it was a bit closer than what I was expecting, though it still wasn't perfect every time. It wasn't as reproducible as um, I thought it was going to be because this is kind of the main shtick of the, of the machine, is perfect pressure profiling reproducibility. For instance, on something like the Decent and a lot of these new machines coming out, you can say, I want this to hit either four mils a second or six bar. And once it hits, one of those two move to the next step. This doesn't have that. So it is trying to react based off pressure to time. So what do I mean by that? I mean, let's say that you have a shot prepared and you've pulled, 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 and you have saved a, a paddle profile for it. And it's, you know, three bar, nine bar, six bar, four bar, and then it stops, all right? So we've dialed in our espresso for that perfectly. And then the next day we come in and we realize it's running quick. It's like, it's not, it's, it's having a difficult time. So we tighten the grind size. If you tighten it too much, what's gonna happen is it's still gonna hit all those pressure points at the same time that it is saved in the machine. So if at five seconds you go to nine, at 10 seconds you go to six, it's gonna do that regardless of the resistance of the puck. If it doesn't hit the output, it'll just stay at whatever the final pressure is until it hits the output or of the, the mills, the set milliliters. It's a very difficult thing to dial in sometimes because it, uh, it, it there is no really forgiveness there. Doing lever styles is kind of difficult. You have to open up this and then you have to slowly and consistently pull that lever down or that paddle to the side so that it can react to the pressure flow of you know a lever. Otherwise it can be really jaggy. And, and on top of that, once you get a lever kind of dialed, it's doing it based off of time. It's not reacting really to what the, is in the puck. It's reacting to time and pressure. That's kind of the components this is reacting to. And and so if you switch your, your, your coffee or whatever, and it is going horribly wrong, I wish there was a way to override the programmed button with the manual control. That would be noise. A lot of these things that I'm pointing out are firmware updates that I'm sure will be made. That's something I'm sure they could do in a couple of hours and then send out an update via Wi-Fi, boom. Now you have the ability to override the programmed shots with the paddle, just in case you need to save a shot. Not to rewrite the program, but to save a shot. From what I've heard from some of their employees is th this has the capability of doing flow profiling, but they are so in the camp that pressure profiling is is superior that they don't want to confuse the market into thinking flow pro profiling is even as is even close to as efficient as pressure profiling. Especially in my testing with this, I've not seen any proof or anything uh, 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 believable that pressure profiling would be better across all platforms and flow profiling. What I mean by this, I have a video on it here, but when, when you're setting a flow, you're setting the water debit for the saturation rate. With this, if you want to saturate quickly, you have to go to a high pressure. And then what it's gonna, what's gonna happen is that pressure is going to and act, it's going to start exerting that amount of pressure on the puck, when maybe you don't want that. Maybe you want something similar to a lever machine where that, that fill rate is at 50 milliliters a second. This obviously can't do that, but let's say you want that really high fill rate, but only with one and a half bar of pressure, like what Steam is giving you. So on a lever machine, you can do super high flow rate with really low pressure. This, if you do super high pressure, or super high flow rate, it necessarily comes with super high pressure, which is an issue. Because then if it starts draining and you wanna cut the pressure down and lower the flow, rate, you have to lower both. And it's because you've not bifurcated the relationship between flow and pressure. You only have control over pressure, which doesn't give you any control over flow. And also, whenever you're doing flow profiles like a Rayo Alange, that's four mils a second, and you just let the pressure do it at once, the pressure there is just a red herring. You're allowing the flow to kind of go through the puck at its whim. Now, here is a big thing that I was discussing recently with Jonathan Gagne. He was saying a big issue with a lot of these machines, especially nine bar machines, is the ever increasing flow to maintain a specific pressure. If a puck doesn't want a, a certain pressure, you wouldn't know you're, you're forcing it. And so the flow rate is going to continually uh, increase in order to maintain a specific pressure. And the issue with that at the end of a shot is higher flow rate through the puck is going to dislodge more and more particles that are gonna cause bitterness, astringency, dryness in the cup. So actually it's better to have lower flow rate near the end. The only way to do this is to kind of guess what the flow rate will be based off the pressure as opposed to be able to reliably set a flow and just let the pressure 
culture kind of go. As I discussed in a previous video with Dr. Samo Smirke on the myths in coffee, he was saying that in sensory tests that they've done at Zurich, the majority panelists weren't able to differentiate six to nine bar shots or nine to 12 bar shots if they were pulled with similar parameters. And so in the end, pressure profiling, yes, it is a good thing. And yes, obviously I, I vouch for it and I love spring lever machines, but that is a vast difference between saying that pressure is, you know, uh, is the end all be all. All that rant to say, I'm very excited because I've, I've heard murmurings that they are actively working on an update to allow for flow profiling, which I think will open up greatly the capabilities of this machine. If I could flow profile with this paddle, which actually feels fantastic, I love this paddle, if they open up flow profiling capabilities with this paddle, I think that is gonna change the game of this machine and make it a lot more user-friendly and a lot more fun to play with. With the flow profiling capability, it opens up filter coffee style drinks, it opens up different styles of shots that the decent community has made. And I know there's currently a conversation going on with Lars at Bean Conqueror to make this compatible with Visualizer so people can share their profiles with one another similar to the decent community. And I think, I think all these machines, there's something to be said for all of them, even if this isn't your cup of tea or if it is there is i think these budding communities around machines especially high-tech ones like this are really helpful for people's own personal experiences now one thing i'd be remiss if i didn't mention uh, is going into the menu and going down to boop, paddle settings at the bottom here you can set the paddle max pressure so if you're someone that loves turbo shots and you don't want to go in and program one i guess you could and you could call it turbo and save it because that's a simple infusion step but you could come here and you can make the max pressure of this profile you can make it six bar or you can make the max pressure four bar and that way you could float you can pressure profile with a max of four so it's essentially giving you an opv a chain a sliding opv but not quite and it's because it's not using an opv it's using back or back Back pressure and the pump. So to give you an idea of what that what I mean by that, I'm gonna close off the valve, top pressure, let's say six bar, turbo shot baby. Barely open the valve, so it's kind of kind of replicable of a of a puck that's really tightly packed and coffee the you know, water has to saturate everything, yada yada yada. But I want you to watch what happens to the pressure right at the beginning. So I need to set this. Now we're set where the top pressure here is gonna be six bar. I yeet it to six, it's filling that puck, and look, it overshoots quite a bit. And it's because it's not an OPV. The only thing it's not really gonna go over is that 12 bar. Every time it's gonna overshoot because it has to have that lag, that communication to the pumps. It's not as fast of a communication as that gear pump. If you go all the way to nine, it won't hit the same fill rate as it will at 12. And that's, like I said, one of the issues with this pressure profiling is you're not able to do those fast fills, which I think for me is a very important aspect of, of creating coffee. I want that fast fill rate without necessarily making that pressure set at 12 bar to get it. I think that the build is pretty nice. It doesn't match La Marzocco's build quality in my opinion. Uh, you have like this panel right here on mine is wobbly. It, it doesn't really stay very well. The leg should be flat to the table and I actually saw this on product photos of the San Remo use. Mine has a pretty massive bend in it and I'm not sure when that happened. The box arrived undamaged, but I guess it could have happened in transit. It also, the back legs are a bit crooked, which with a 37 kilo machine makes me, you know, a little wary on, on it should be fine, but it's, you know, not ideal for that to happen. Uh, because there's this plastic up front and the temperature gets really high, I guess there is potentially a fear of that heat affecting the screen. And now this is something I'm not that worried about because things like this should be rated really highly, but you never know. Even iPhones still have this issue with overheating. So even some of the most tech things in the world that the whole company is based on this screen, um, that is something that could potentially be an issue because this is right above that scorching hot piece of brass. I really like the way you enter into the water tank. It is a very nice, robust three liter water tank, very easy to fill. It tells you when it's out of water on the screen. You have to click okay once you're filled. Um, so so that, that's a nice thing. What I don't enjoy is, I can click this all day, there we go. And unless you go hard on the bottom, it doesn't actuate. There is a really weird, a really weird um, setting that you can put on, which I'm not a fan of, but it is a setting you can do, and we can, we're gonna put it on now, um, Steam Wand Purge. So I'm gonna click that on. So what this does, and I really just, it's really weird. So you can have it so one click purges it, Okay, or a long hold will turn it on. 
Okay, so that is hard to remember, I'll be honest with you. I was trying to steam milk the other day and forgot the purge was on. And so I was turning it on and it started steaming my milk for three seconds and turned off. And I was like, what the heck? I got a coffee that I've not yet opened. And what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna put it on a random grind size and I'm gonna pressure profile the coffee with the paddle. And then I'm gonna save whatever that profile is and we're gonna just kind of replicate it to see how well it does in replication. But before we do that, I do need to point out um, the, the porta filters are made really well. They're really nice porta filters, but depending on where you are at in the world, the baskets are vastly different. I know in Australia, they seem to come with IMSs. Out here in Europe, or at least where the, the vendor that my friend bought it from, these are like, I don't know if I've ever seen worse baskets than these. So these, this is what came with it. And it's um, pretty shoddy. It's definitely a stamped basket and you can't see it on the camera, but there are at least four holes blocked on this basket. And that's what came stock with this. And it also comes with a double shot and a single shot porta filter. I wish it was a double and a naked. Uh, everyone I see is having to go and buy a third party naked porta filter, which is just unfortunate. Single shots, I understand there's like 14 of you all out there in the world, but let's be real, the majority of us are wanting these naked porta filters. Anyway, so I'm gonna use my canal porta filter. I love this. I'm gonna pull this luminous uh, Koji processed Columbia from Virgil Estates and uh, Shout out Christopher Ferran and Mason Salisbury. All right, we got 20 grams in the basket on a random grind size. Let's go ahead and pressure profile this baby. So we're gonna open it up, fast fill rate. And then, oh yeah, there we go. I'm gonna go all the way down to 0.2 bar. We're gonna do like a blooming thing. I don't think this is nearly fine enough for a bloomer, but we're just gonna do a bloomer anyway. We'll wait till 20 seconds and we'll open it back up. Yeah, we got that red exclamation point, there we go. So we're opening it up to, oh, I forgot I have it at six bars. So we'll open it up to six and we'll let it eat for a bit. Then we're gonna close it back down. Down to three. All right, 50 grams out. So 20 and 50 out and we did that in 36 seconds. I'm gonna go ahead and taste it. That actually pulled pretty well. So uh, overall it says 119 milliliters. That's what I'm saying. Mine is miscalibrated. That's about 40 mils off of what it should be or 30 maybe. But anyway, let's taste this. It's actually pretty nice. So thankfully we ended it in enough time that the graph shows it all. It was a 36 second shot. Here's the flow going through the puck. Anyway, we're gonna click save. We're gonna make this paddle profile one. Now I'm gonna re-prepare this shot. Same grind size, same dose, 20 grams. This boom, 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 we're gonna hit go and we're gonna see if we get the same output, which was right around 50.4 after the drippy drips hit. I'm going heavy today. Number one is McLovin. So I'm gonna hit number one and here we go. So it's gonna try to attempt the same thing. It's yeeting up to 5'2", 5'4", 5'6", 5'8", 5'9". right, and there comes some of the drippy drippies for the nice sippy sippy. Okay, it looks like it's a, yeah, it's about where it was the last time, about seven grams, eight grams in the cup. Maybe a little further, uh, further than the last shot, but we'll see what happens next. There comes the big yeet. There we go, we're up to 30 grams at 29 seconds. It's going back down, slowing down the pressure up. Oh. 32 seconds. So four seconds shy, I believe, or five seconds shy than the last one. Can't exactly remember. Um, of course, that's not proving there's anything wrong with the machine. It could have gone faster because putt prep could be an issue. That graph does look very similar. There's gonna be inconsistency that could be on my side, could be on the grinder side, could be on uh, the tamp side. It could be on any side, really. Well, this one's cooled down now. It's hard to really judge. This though, I think the first sip was better. It made my mouth water a lot more. Let's get some oat milk steaming. I have it set at 1.9 bar pressure. We're gonna clear it out. Got a bing, bada boom. That big steam wand, just bring it over to the side. I'm just gonna stretchy, stretchy, stretchy. Make sure my wand's in the right position. Boom, Dunsey. Make silky milky. I'm sure that the texture's fantastic. Of course it's fantastic, I steamed it. That is everything. Thank you so much for paying attention and watching. Again, if you've made it this far, please hit the like and subscribe. Check out my Patreon, check out my Instagram, do all the cool stuff. I'm talking like the side effects on a pharmaceutical uh, advertisement. Love you all. Hope you brew something tasty today and cheers.